Right, this is the time in the service that we welcome those. We turn on the streaming service and we welcome those who are tuning in uh, online. We're glad that you can join us for this portion of uh, our worship service this morning. Sorry you missed out on the donuts. It's one of the, if you're online, we can't get you a donut, all right? However, I mean yet, maybe one of these days we'll be able to stream donuts. You know, I, uh, yeah, the, the kids can leave. I, it was just... Uh, you know, this is the part where Mike does his little comedy act, but um, as, as they're going out, uh, maybe you saw these on the table downstairs, May 11th, um, you can go over to Chick-fil-A at 123rd and Dodge, and between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., um, you can mention Sunshine at the time of the purchase, and a portion of those proceeds will be donated to Sunshine, and we're going to use that money to help um, reestablish the mulch in our playground area, all right? So um, May 11th, and there's a few of these flyers that are out in the foyer, or it, it did come in your weekly email this last week, and we'll repeat it next week as well. So um, take advantage of that if you can. All right, I've got a couple other announcements. Let me remind you that uh, after the service today, it's men's outing time. Men's outing. So um, I, I, th I think it's all right if I say this. Uh, we did have a deadline for replying by Thursday. We had 23 guys already sign up. Fantastic, but we could scoop up a few more, I guess, if, if Karsten will give up his hamburger. Um, okay, never mind. You're on your own. Uh, so scoop up your own lunch. Head out to the Hanson's cabin, and uh, we'll play some horseshoes. We'll try to we'll huddle together for warmth, and um, and then uh, we'll grill hamburgers and brats for our evening meal together. So we look forward to that. Uh, and then next week, next Sunday, not, not Sunday, not strike that. Next Saturday morning is our work day. Next Saturday morning is our work day. And so if you want to come out at 9 o'clock on Saturday, we will have jobs for everybody. The main focus is to put in that mulch, all right, into the playground and just get that distributed around. We also want to mulch some of the other plant beds around. But then there's lighter work, too. If you say, no, I can't, I can't wield a shovel or a pitchfork or whatever, um, we've got dusting, we've got glass cleaning, we've got nursery toy washing. So uh, we will get an email out to you this week, and you'll be able to look at that list and say, you know what, I could do that. I, I can't do everything, but I could do that. And uh, we'd love to have you come out at 9 o'clock next Saturday and be a part of that. Uh, I think that's all of the announcements that I have. Um, there was, well, this is more on the side of a personal announcement. Um, this is Karsten and Kaya's first anniversary. And this is the Rogers 60th anniversary. Wow. Huh? 60 years. Really impressive. So you know, we give thanks for them and their testimony of faithfulness to the Lord in their marriage. Let's, let's go to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and it's worth applauding. It's worth celebrating. It's uh, uh, with delight in these things. Um, what a wonderful work you have done in Karsten and Kaya's life to bring them together and to start them on a journey together. And um, we're just thrilled. We, we love the testimony that they are to the church in the way that they have begun their marriage and how they continue to invest and incorporate um, into the church here. And at the same time, we look all the way to the other side of the spectrum, 60 years uh, for Jim and Irene, and, and what an amazing accomplishment that is. And I know that they would immediately give all glory to you. Um, those of us who are married know that it requires work, um, and that work is a service to you. It's a blessing to learn servanthood in the context of marriage, to learn how servanthood is a, is a dimension of love. And in that in that place, in that laboratory of marriage, uh, to learn the lessons of love and patience and humility and endurance uh, and delight and blessing and, and, and all of it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this institution. Continue to bless these couples uh, in the days ahead. Heavenly Father, uh, of course, today again, we want to uh, pray for Ukraine and specifically for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Tremendous suffering that is going on there. 
and yet we, we know of stories of people who are persevering in their faith. Uh, though anxiety and fear no doubt haunts all their days, you are walking with them through the valley of the shadow of death. And we pray that you would comfort them, give them courage, and um, uphold and, and, and sustain them through these very difficult days. I pray that you would preserve them from danger, preserve their lives and preserve their livelihoods. And even as, as they have already, in many places, uh, churches gathered already today and, um, and braved whatever it may be to come together and to pray and to sing and to declare your word, we ask that your blessing would be upon their churches. And we pray in the midst of this horrible trial going on in our world, many would look heavenward and find that the answer does not lie here in this world, does not lie with man, but lies in faith in our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to that end, Heavenly Father, we're reminded that, that the great bolster of our faith is, this, is the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, as Pastor Brian comes to lead us this morning, we pray that you'd bless him and uh, guide our minds into thoughts of the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. My title is The Resurrection of Jesus and Progressive Christianity, but before I get to that, um, you may have heard in the news that Naomi Judd passed away, a country singer, and the family was very uh, upfront about her struggle uh, with mental illness, and so applaud them for their bravery for that. And I just say that because on Wednesday nights, we have a group called Families Transform that meets right down the hallway there at 630 and it's a, it's a safe place for, uh, for people who have loved ones who are struggling with mental illness. And if you'd like any more information about that group, you could talk to me or talk to Dale. Raise your hand there, Dale. And uh, it's a different topic every week. Uh, this week's topic is called uh, Life-Giving Community. Life-Giving Community. Back in the, now getting to the sermon. Uh, again, good morning. Uh, back in the last half of the 1980s, the early years of the 1990s, I was a pastor of a church in a small town in central Nebraska. There was a boy in the church who accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior very early in life. He was in church every Sunday with his, his mother and his siblings. Uh, he attended the, the Wednesday night children's program for, for years. During that, through that program, he memorized over 200 Bible verses. And over the years, he told me more than once that he wanted to be a pastor. And that excited me. I mean, I just, I just prayed for him. I encouraged him. In my very last conversation with him, about the end of 1993, um, right before we moved to another state, I told him that someday we're going to be colleagues. Uh, I won't be quite to retirement age by the time you get through seminary. And so we're going to be colleagues someday. Well, he graduated from high school. He went to college, and he majored in philosophy. In college, he began to question his faith, and he went through a journey that I know now as a, a deconstruction journey. He deconstructed his Christian faith, and he eventually renounced his faith and became an atheist, which is heartbreaking. I continue to pray for him that he would come back uh, to the Lord. Now, in, in recent years, uh, there's been a lot of former evangelical Christians who go down this deconstruction path. Uh, notable ones would be like Joshua Harris, uh, Abraham Piper. They've renounced, uh, renounced their evangelical faith and became atheists. Now, not everyone who de deconstructs their faith becomes an atheist. Many become progressive Christians. And today I want to continue my series on progressive Christianity and the undermining of the Christian faith. Many progressive Christians were former evangelical Christians, and now they have deconstructed their faith. That means that the Christianity they were taught, they were raised in, um, and believed in no longer works for them. And there's many reasons why a person begins this deconstruction process. Maybe their faith was challenged. 
um, in a university classroom or through certain podcast or YouTube channel. Maybe their faith was rattled when something tragic happened in their life or uh, something happened in the world, and their faith was unable to navigate them through that. Uh, maybe it's a Christian truth that is difficult to grasp, like the reality of an eternal hell or that Jesus is the only way to God. Often people deconstruct their faith or they become uh, progressive Christians because in their hearts and minds there's, there's a clash, there's a conflict between current culture and what God says in the Bible. And both the progressive Christian movement and the deconstruction movement are gaining momentum much because of social media. And the deconstruction movement is connected to pro progressive Christianity because to become a progressive Christian one most likely will have to go down this deconstruction journey of some kind. Now, a few weeks ago, we asked the question, what is progressive Christianity? I think I've been posting this um, every week. Uh, progressive Christianity is an open, intelligent, and collaborative approach to the Christian tradition and the life and teachings of Jesus that creates a pathway into an authentic and relevant religious experience. So this assumes, this statement, by the way, this is from progressivechristianity.org, right from their website, it assumes that the pathway of an evangelical and biblical Christianity does not and cannot be a pathway into authentic and relevant religious experience. And they will say that, to, that because an authentic and relevant religious experience for the progressive Christian is going to be a life-free from the evangelical church, free from tr truth claims, absolutes, and free from doctrine. So in the past weeks, we've seen how progressive Christianity undermines historic Christianity. Several ways, for example, progressive Christianity claims that the Bible is a human book, and it, it's not the authoritative word of God. And yet the evidence, as we've seen, is overwhelming that the Bible's very reliable and thus can be trusted. Second example, we looked at this a couple weeks ago, uh, two or three weeks ago, is that progressive Christianity undermines the severity of sin in people's lives and in the world. And so when the deconstructive, uh, destructive consequences of sin are minimized, there's no need for a savior. There's no need for a redeemer. They would say, yes, Jesus died on the cross, but his death was not a substitutionary atoning death. His death was not a payment for our sins. Rather, Jesus was crucified because he spoke the truth to a very angry crowd and he willingly died as an example of love and forgiveness towards his enemies. So today we're going to focus on the resurrection of Jesus. Two Sundays ago we celebrated the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Here's a quote from the Converged Church webpage and what we believe. Jesus Christ, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit. We believe in his virgin birth, sinless life, miracles and teachings. We believe in his substitutionary atoning death, bodily resurrection, ascension into heaven, perpetual intercession for his people, and personal visible return to earth. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. The, the resurrection of Jesus is a fact. It's one of the most documented events in history, including this passage of Scripture that we, I read earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let's take a look at verses 1 and 2 again. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain." So the, the language that Paul's using here is that he's passing on to the Corinthians a body of information that he received from others. This body of information was the gospel, which has the power to save, notice, unless they believed in vain. That last uh, statement is important because it tells us that it's possible to have a, a shallow, non-saving faith. And it also serves as a warning that unless our faith is in the gospel of historic and biblical Christianity and that we hold fast to it, then we have believed in, in vain. The statement also serves as a warning to those who are in the progressive Christian movement because that movement undermines the Christian faith in the New Testament. That's why Alisa Childers' book is called Another Gospel because the that gospel of progressive Christianity is vastly different from the gospel of the New Testament. And I put that up because this is a wonderful, wonderful resource if you want to know about progressive Christianity. 
uh, because she went through a deconstruction process herself and then came back. Uh, the true gospel uh, contains certain facts, and we see this in verses 3 to 5. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also required, received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Now, many Christian scholars believe these verses are an early Christian creed. Creeds were recited to learn important doctrines and to pass that information on to others. How early was this creed in 1 Corinthians 15? Well, we know that the death and resurrection of Jesus took place in either A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, one of the two. Paul, the apostle, the author of 1 Corinthians, was converted to Christ within a couple years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Most likely, Paul was taught this early Christian creed when he was converted. So how early was it? Very, very early. It was formulated within two to five years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Even liberal scholars cannot deny this. Uh, here's a quote from a liberal scholar. So the, the, the elements in this tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion, no later than three years after the death of Jesus. And this creed was formulated in Jerusalem, the very city Jesus died in, was buried, and was raised from the dead. Now, there are skeptics out there that say that the resurrection of Jesus was simply a legend that slipped into the Christian narrative over the course of time. But since this creed was put together only two to five years uh, after Jesus died, this, there's not enough time for a legend about his resurrection to form and to, to circulate and to creep into the, the narrative. A, a legend takes a long time to form and then circulate. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians in A.D. 54, which is either 24 years or 21 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's still too short of a time for a legend to form and to be inserted into the story especially since there were still eyewitnesses around uh, that saw the resurrected Jesus. So this creed was circulated, recited only a few years after the, the events of the resurrection, and in the very city the events took place. So if someone wanted to question all this, uh, and wanted to question the resurrection, there was plenty of, of places to go, plenty of people to talk to about it, including the apostles. Now, it's interesting, it seems like every year around Easter, there's going to be documentaries on PBS and the National Geographic Channel or the History Channel that will question and attack uh, the resurrection of Jesus. And it makes sense, because if, if you're going to attack Christianity, you've got to go after the resurrection. If the bodily resurrection of Jesus can be explained away or disproved, then Christianity crumbles to the ground, and Paul made that clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So how do progressive Christians understand the resurrection of Jesus? Well, some will say it's simply a myth, a story made up by the followers of Jesus. Uh, progressive Christians, we saw this before, they don't believe in miracles, so certainly the miracle of the resurrection has to be wiped away somehow. Other progressive Christians would say that the, the resurrection of Jesus was a spiritual one that the followers of Jesus experienced. Again, uh, right from progressivechristianity.org, uh, what we know somehow, Jesus was alive to his most ardent followers in a compelling way. They continue to experience and have a sense of his presence as a living reality. Resurrection and the remarkable humanity of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus sparked the birth of a new awareness a new self-consciousness, hearts and spirits of his followers, uh, in the hearts and minds and spirits of his followers. This new awareness and consciousness came to them in their vivid memory of the remarkable human uh, person Jesus was. In the weeks and days and months after the cross, here are some of the things that they remembered. You could just go down this list. This is happening in the hearts and the minds of the believers, of the disciples, and then the last paragraph, I know this is a long quote, uh, I cannot stress enough the outstanding human being Jesus was. Indeed, this 
is what explains the resurrection experience. It was precisely his remarkable humanity that kept him alive in the hearts and spirits of his followers. It was a small wonder, therefore, that after his death, Jesus continued to appear to people in visions or other uh, aboriginal trance-like experiences. Again, it was his extraordinary humanity that explains this as he continued to be alive to his followers in his life-giving ways. So in that statement, nothing about an empty tomb Uh, Nothing about the resurrected Jesus appearing to people. So is the resurrection of Jesus just a made-up story, or at best, uh, is it just a spiritual resurrection that lives in the hearts and minds of Christians? Well, There are many facts when it comes to the resurrection. We're going to look at five of them. Uh, Again, this is... Uh, this information, just look up the, the podcast and the blog of Elisa Childers. Mike Winger's YouTube channel is fantastic source of information. He's got a, a whole series on progressive Christianity. Sean McDowell's another. Just uh, Google him. And he's got a great podcast as well. Again, five facts that we're going to look at. First, Jesus died by crucifixion. Now, some skeptics will claim that Jesus never really died. It just appeared that he died. And so he was buried, and somehow in that tomb he revived, and and then somehow got out of that very secure tomb. We're going to see how secure it is in a moment. And then he slept, uh, slipped past through very trained and disciplined Roman guards, and then convinced his followers that he was miraculously raised from the dead. Now let's let's think about that. What does the Bible say? What do the Gospels say? Which, by the way, are historical documents. So it says that after Jesus was arrested, he was beaten by the Roman guards. They blindfolded him. They they took turns in in punching and slapping Jesus. They mocked him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? After Pilate could not convince the, the crowd that Jesus was innocent, he ordered that Jesus be flogged or scourged before he was crucified. Roman scourging and flogging was horrific. Uh, Jesus was tied to a post, beaten with a leather whip that was interwoven with pieces of bone and metal, and that would easily just tear through skin and tissue, exposing bones and and intestines. Uh, Many people couldn't even survive the flogging part. Then after he was flogged, he was forced to to carry the, the beam of the cross to the place of crucifixion in Jerusalem, known as Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. But he was so weak because of the flogging and because of the lack of blood, uh, he was unable to. And so the Roman guards forced a bystander named Simon to carry the cross. When Jesus arrived at Golgotha, he was nailed to the cross by the Roman guards, who, by the way, were professional executioners. They could do this with it blindfolded. Uh, Nails were, the nails that went were uh, inserted into Jesus, pounded into Jesus, went through his wrists, about right here, and through his feet. Crucifixion is believed by many to be the worst kind of execution ever devised. On top of the public shame, there's just excruciatory pain. I'll spare you the details, but if a person did not die on the cross due to physical trauma, then he, he eventually died due to suffocation. In John chapter 19, verse 30, tells us that Jesus died. He said, it is finished. In other words, his work of redemption was accomplished. He he bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. We read a few verses later in that passage that the Roman guards were ordered to to break the legs of Jesus to hasten his death. But they realized he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs, which was a a fulfillment of prophecy. But they did pierce his side with a spear, and water and blood came out. And all four Gospels provide details of the crucifixion of Jesus. First century historians like Josephus and and Taxidus uh, also write about the crucifixion of Jesus. After Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea, who was on the Jewish council, people knew him, a wealthy member of the council, requested for the body of Jesus. Then they anointed the dead body with 75 pounds of myrrh and alloys, according to John 19, 39. He was then wrapped in linen cloths, placed in a brand new rock tomb owned by Jus- jo- Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph, yes, um, uh, of Arimathea, which he could be tracked down, by the way, as well. Then a great stone was rolled to the entrance of the tomb. Nothing can get in, nothing can get out, and the Pharisees wanted to make sure of that, so they convinced Pilate to place Roman soldiers at the tomb to guard it. So this would have been four to 16 Roman guards 
guarding the tomb of Jesus. So we read about that in Matthew 17. So Jesus died by crucifixion, and he was buried. The scene was set for the most important event uh, in history, which would be the resurrection of Jesus. Many years ago, a young man said to me, he said, and he, this was complete ignorance at, on his part, but he says, we can't even be sure that Jesus even lived, even existed. Well, the fact is, is overwhelming, uh, overwhelming evidence that Jesus was a real person. And the evidence is overwhelming that he died by crucifixion. And for a resurrection to take place, Jesus had to die. There is a second fact. Uh, women were the first to find the empty tomb of Jesus. This is huge. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, report that women were the first to discover the empty tomb. Why is this important information? Because women back then were not considered to be reliable sources of information. Their words were taken with a grain of salt. Uh, that explains why in Luke chapter 24, the women appeared to the apostles to report to them that the tomb of Jesus was empty. And their response was this. This is the response of the apostles. Their words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. See, women back then could not testify in court. So again, some progressive Christians believe the resurrection of Jesus was a myth made up by the disciples. So if the disciples fabricated the resurrection, then women would not be the first to go to the tomb of Jesus and discover that it was empty. A lie about the resurrection would not begin with the testimony of women. A lie would maybe have Pilate go and investigate, take a look at what's going on there. Or maybe some well-known Pharisee go down and make sure that the guards were still there at the tomb. Start the story like that if you're going to have a lie. The fact is that faithful followers of Jesus who were women were the first to discover the tomb of Jesus. There is a third fact. There were independent appearances of Jesus alive after his death. Again, this creed in 1 Corinthians 15 was formulated three to five years after the death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus. After stating that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised on the third day, we read in verse 5 that it appeared to Cephas, uh, Cephas was the Aramaic name for the Apostle Peter. Then Jesus appeared to the twelve, namely the original twelve apostles, disciples, minus Judas, plus Messiah, who was uh, uh, brought on in Acts chapter 1. Then verse 6 says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So at, at one time, during that 40 days between the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, Jesus made one appearance to over 500 believers at one time. Uh, some have fallen asleep, that is, they passed away, but most of them, 20 years plus later, are still alive. And this was an open-ended invitation by Paul for the Corinthians to investigate this uh, matter on, for themselves. Uh, you know, think back, it's 2022 now. Think back three to five years of all the events that have happened in this world that has happened uh, in, in our lives. I mean, certainly COVID would be part of that. Um, but think of September 9th, 2018. What happened on September 9th, 2018? Well, the members of Eagle Heights Church and the members of Harvey Oaks Baptist Church voted to consolidate. And the church, two churches became one church. The next Sunday... Right here in this worship center, we came together for the first time as one church. And a few weeks later, we decided on the name Converge Church. So Converge Church has been in existence for almost four, to, four years now. It's in that three to five year range. But how do we really know that we consolidated? and That the consolidation took place? I mean, really, do we really know that this is a fact? Of course we do. There are, there are documents there are minutes from both churches that both churches voted in, in, uh, in favor of this. We officially uh, voted to consolidate. On top of that, many of us were there that Sunday on September 9th, either Eagle Heights or Harvey Oaks Baptist Church. We were witnesses of the fact that this vote took place. And so many of you were there uh, as well. Let's, uh, so we were there, we can verify the facts. Let's go back a little bit further. Long before the consolidation... At the bottom of the stairs, there's this plaque. Uh, this building, this present building, was 
dedicated on November 21st, 1976. I was there that Sunday morning. I was a senior in high school. Uh, I remember the president of the denomina- our, our converged denomination preached that Sunday. His name was Warren Magnuson. That was over 45 years ago. Uh, Leroy was probably there. Uh, some others were probably there as well. Uh, Doug was probably there as well. Uh, a long time ago, and I remember it, and we have witnesses of that effect over 45 years ago. Well, in the same way, within three to five years of the death and resurrection of Jesus, an official document was formulated, a creed was formulated by the eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus that stated that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. And during the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension into heaven, Jesus appeared to hundreds of people, and many of those eyewitnesses were still alive when Paul wrote the letter a couple decades later. Let's go on to the fourth fact. Violence was endured by the apostles. You know, think about the disciples when Jesus was arrested. Remember when he was put on trial and crucified. They were cowards. They, they were deserters. And yet after the resurrection of Jesus, and, and Jesus appeared to them, they became bold witnesses for him. They were all willing to die for Jesus, and most of them did. John, one of the original 12 apostles, was not martyred, but he was persecuted and exiled to the island of Patmos. Uh, I want to preach a sermon series someday on the apostles and the martyrdom uh, of of them uh, because none of them recanted. Not one apostle said to the authorities, you know, before you behead me or before you crucify me or before you burn me at the stake, I just want to say it was all a lie. The resurrection of Jesus did not take place. We made it up, so please let me go. Not one apostle did that. They endured torture and death because Jesus was raised from the dead. According to tradition, the apostle Peter was martyred. He requested to be crucified upside down because he did not want to die in the same manner of his Lord and Savior, Jesus. There's one more fact. The enemies of Jesus were converted. The enemies of Jesus were converted. When we open our New Testament, we see 13 letters written by the Apostle Paul. 13. And we see another letter written by James and another letter written by Jude. At one time, all three men were enemies of Jesus. Let's start with James and Jude. They were the half-brothers of Jesus. And during the public ministry of Jesus, they opposed him. Early on in the ministry, the family receives a report that Jesus was so busy and the crowds were pressing in him so much that he couldn't even eat. And so they traveled to, and it says, to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. So they thought Jesus suffered with mental illness. And so they went on this rescue mission to get him out of that situation. And then before his death and resurrection, uh, the family of Jesus were not followers of Christ and disciples. John chapter 7 verse 5 says, for not even his brothers believed in him. So both James and Jude saw Jesus alive after his death and they were converted. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 7 says that he appeared to James and then to all the apostles and they became followers of Jesus. Uh, that James is a half-brother of Jesus, the same James who wrote the book of James. Now, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then James and John would even have a stronger case that their brother was struggling with some sort of mental illness. Uh, Then there was Paul, early in the book of Acts. He was Saul, the Pharisee, who sought out the destruction of Christianity. He was a murderer of Christians. In Acts chapter 9, he was on his way to Damascus to arrest the followers of Jesus. Acts 9.1 says that Saul was breathing threats of, and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And on that road to Damascus, the resurrected Jesus appeared to him, spoke to Saul, and, and Saul, the murderous enemy of Christianity, was converted. Uh, the Pharisee, uh, Saul the Pharisee became Paul the Apostle, and he was used by God to spread the gospel throughout the world. Again, he was persecuted for the rest of his life and eventually martyred for his faith. Um, And he considered himself, as we see in this passage, the least of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Jesus appeared to hundreds of people after his resurrection. 
In John chapter 20, verse 29, the resurrected Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And since that time, millions of people have not seen the resurrected Jesus, but they have placed their faith in Christ, and they believe, and thus blessed by the Lord. Last week, uh, during one of, between softball games, uh, 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 another player came up to me. I've known him for a, a year or two. Uh, he joined the league a couple years ago. And uh, he told me that six months ago, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Six months ago, he and his wife... Uh, at a local church in Omaha, turned to Jesus. And as we had, had a long conversation, and he, and he kept wanting to tell his story, which is great, so I listened. And, and I could see uh, in this person uh, uh, kind of a radiance. Um, he, he was changed. His vocabulary changed. Um, I could see the joy uh, in his eyes. I could see the sense of peace of his demeanor. His, his life was changed. And, and the only reason his life has changed is because Jesus Christ died for his sins, Jesus Christ was buried, and Jesus Christ was raised to new life and gives us victory uh, over sin, death, and Satan. So all glory goes to Jesus, and praise the Lord, we serve a risen Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have uh, everlasting life. We, we thank you, Lord, for the miracle of the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection and the power of the resurrection that can live in each of our lives, Lord. And if there's anybody here that has not trusted Jesus to be Lord and Savior, uh, we pray that today will be the day of salvation. Uh, we thank you that we do serve a risen Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Let me just remind you uh, that uh, it's our des great desire at Converge Church that we not just have a monologue, a uh, weekly monologue, but that we enter into discussion and conversation. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about the resurrection or the implications of the resurrection in our lives, a good place to take those up would be in our community groups that will start uh, just a few minutes after we release you here. Um, you can join one of those community groups, get in a circle, and this is the place where we can bring out our questions and, and discussion and things like that. So encourage you, please consider joining one of our groups. Um, if not, if you're not quite ready to take that step, then fill out the little form that's in the, under, underneath the chair in front of you, and if you'll put down an email uh, address in there and get that to us. Jot down your question. One of the pastors would be just delighted to get back with you and, and keep this conversation going about the significance and importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you again so much for being here this morning. Let's stand and let's sing one more time together.